Welcome to part two of Holy Trinity's sessions on Saints of the Americas. Last week we saw the story of French Jesuit martyrs that helped to bring the Christian faith to the new world. They embodied the joyful witness that Bishop Bonner challenges us to. And this week we see another of his priorities, prayer, this time embraced by St. Kateri Tikalitha. She was born in 1656 and lived much of her life around the site of the present-day St. Kateri National Shrine and Historic Site in Fonda, New York. When Kateri was 18 years old, a Jesuit missionary came to her community and established a chapel. She was fascinated by the stories she heard about Jesus Christ and wanted to learn more about him and to become a Christian. She often went to the woods alone to speak to God and to listen to him in her heart and in the voice of nature, and she dedicated herself to a life of prayer. Kateri is the patron saint of the environment and of ecology. Saints of the Americas is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church celebrated in the Americas. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Welcome to our show. We're going to talk about St. Kateri Tikawitha. You know, it's interesting because St. Kateri obviously is the, the only uh, North American Indian uh, to be canonized. Uh, she was born in New York, but then she died a, in Canada. And we're going to talk about uh, what happened in between uh, her birth and, and her death. Obviously, her death was at, at a young age, so we know that. So let's talk about her beginnings uh, as, an, as an American Indian or a North American Indian, uh, what that would have been like at that time. Well, certainly we know that uh, as it was for other cultures, uh, to be a girl in that mm -hmm. society was certainly a second-class citizen. So right there, she's at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, but also the sense of conversion among uh, Native American Indians is not welcomed by the Indian population. Uh, uh, unlike other societies that might have just easily rejected it, you know, you put your life at risk and we'll see that mm -hmm. uh, later with uh, Kateri. Uh, but it, it was a challenge for her. Her family experienced um, some difficulties. One of the reasons also why conversion was um, so frowned upon, it wasn't always just out of a religious sense, mm -hmm. um, going against what the Native Americans, how they would have worshipped or what they would have mm -hmm. um, done in their culture, but it was the exposure of illness that they believed the quote unquote white man, which oftentimes were the missionaries that were bringing this sense of conversion, it was the exposure to illness. And so with superstition and with all these other things that were going about, that would have been, it, it just created all kinds of difficulties. And we see that um, introduced into Kateri's family's life as well. You know, it's interesting because um uh, she died at the age of, uh, of 24, uh, but we know that her mother, who was a, an Algonquin Indian, uh, herself was baptized. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that faith that she had uh, was really given to her and passed on to her uh, by her mother. And it's something that, that she uh, truly loved and truly cared for because she decided to give her whole life uh, to Christ. And she even pledged uh, celibacy, virginity. And that was another thing that was really totally um, uh, not allowed or permitted mm -hmm. through her uh, American Indian upbringing. You know, so, so this is something. Uh, and they would have felt that that wasn't even her choice. Exactly. You know, it, it, it certainly was not a, a young Kateri's choice whether or not she get married or not. This, this went against every societal norm there was. And again, going back to the illness too, uh, we see that uh, tragedy does enter her life. Both her parents and her brother um, die in a smallpox epidemic. And so there's a stigma attached to the family. There's this, this faith that is brought in by these people who've introduced this illness. She's decided to do something in their sense that's perverted, to not marry, to not procreate, to not have children. So there was a great sense of skepticism. I mean, her life and her desire to live that life center on Christ challenged every notion 
that her people held. We also see that there's this, um, this group of, of Jesuits who really protected her. And mm -hmm. so they kind of take her uh, under their wings because uh, she's so uh, vehement about practicing and living mm -hmm. this faith and devoting herself uh, and her virginity to Christ. And, and so they kind of take her under their wings, not only as, as a spiritual advisor, but also as someone who protects her, who moves her uh, even geographically to different places mm -hmm. where she could enjoy uh, living and practicing her faith. Uh, but we know that um, this Lily of the Mohawk, uh, who um, took on this, um, this role as a virgin, uh, totally against her community, uh, only lives to the age of 24. Mm -hmm. And so her young life that was, was really not spent uh, in any length of years, yet there's a wealth of, of life and longevity in that short span because of what she experienced. And let's talk a little bit more about what she would have experienced internally, not having her family or her tribe around her, uh, but being with, with strangers, but people of the same faith and how that would have uh, been more of a welcome to her than maybe her own people. Well, in a, in a sense, although they were Jesuit priests mm -hmm. and she's a, a, a Native American girl, we could say that she found a community, which is what communi religious communities become for individuals. They sure. form this family. And so, as you said, she's certainly suffering the loss of her parents, her brother, um, the stigma and the loss of her community, because we can't make it so cut and dry. We can't say that because she loved God, it was so easy to just turn her back on her Native American community. That would have been a, an internal struggle and difficulty. Um, but she did find that interior peace with these people who had the same faith mm -hmm. and who perhaps she found great comfort in the fact that they were looking at her and they found worth and value and dignity in her, that they approved of her decision mm -hmm. to remain celibate, to not get married, to not have children, to give herself completely over to Christ in that way. Um, but I think also part of why we, we recognize her as a saint, and although you know she's living in the 1600s, why she's a great example to young people today is she was able to go against all of those different cultures and all of those different, if we will, peer pressures of the day to remain firm in her love of Christ. And isn't that what we need for our young people today? Mm -hmm. to, to not give in to all of those societal norms that unfortunately have become accepted and, and to stay more rooted in Christ. I can't help but think of uh, what an inspiration she would have been to those missionaries. You know, oftentimes uh, we, we see missionaries as being uh, someone who, people who inspire others, but they in turn need inspiration from those who become part of their flock. And obviously they would have found tremendous inspiration uh, through her, not only because of her uh, acceptance of the faith, but also because of her desire to stay steadfast and firm in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, her allegiance to the Lord did not waver. And so I'm sure that was a, a tremendous uh, sense of um, inspiration to those French Jesuits at the time uh, who took her under their wing. Uh, we're going to talk about some other saints in a moment, but we're going to take a quick break. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. <music> 